goodness. How about that? She's just, she just makes my heart just flutter. It's just fluttering. In a good way, though. Unicorns and fluttering hearts, whatever. It's the last day. You guys know we go a little wheels off on this day. Um, hey, everybody, you made it. Are you so proud of yourselves? Or are you just real tuckered out? <laughs> I'm really proud of you. Um, listen, uh, we got some cool things that are gonna happen at the end of the day. We're gonna end it a little differently. All, obviously, we've already started in backwards order, which thank you, you all figured it out. You're here, I'm glad. We got some tables in the back. I'll tell you a little bit about those in a minute. But um, first, I, I just wanna remind you that um, this, this whole thing we've been doing is to understand a little bit more about God, right? Is to understand his heart just a tiny bit more. Every mountaintop we've encountered, right, has been like this moment where we get to know his character a little deeper. We get to figure out, okay, what do we do with this and how do we take it back down into the valley of Flower Mound, Texas, 2024, amen, right? And I feel like just if there's ever a way that we can look at this whole six weeks we spent together and go, you know, I just, I wanna live a little bit more like Jesus because of it, then we win, right? We're not looking to be Bible scholars. We just wanna be Jesus followers, amen? Well, we're gonna start today with a history lesson because who doesn't love that? <laughs> Y'all are like, we don't love that, no. Okay, I have a question. How many people are familiar with this amazing um, evangelical pastor guy, D.L. Moody. Anybody familiar with D.L. Moody and his story? Yeah, okay, cool. Then you can come tell people because I just did like this deep dive on D.L. Moody because here's why. I noticed this about me. Whenever I'm looking for quotes and whenever I'm, I'm going to look about uh, like theologians that say certain things and then they always quote D.L. Moody, I'm like, this guy is awesome. He's quirky and he's practical and he's got powerful wisdom. Well, I looked a little bit into him because I found this quote that I'm gonna share with you in a minute, but D.L. Moody, this is what I want you to know about him. He was a 19th century evangelist, but you know what my favorite part of his story is? That when he was a young teenager, he was working at a shoe sales shop. His uncle had a shop and so he was a shoe salesman. Well, during that period of time, he's a teenager, and so he starts going to Sunday school. He starts learning about Jesus, and he has this one Sunday school teacher, and every Sunday, he would learn. But the thing that was so cool about that Sunday school teacher is one day he showed up at the shoe shop, and he told him about Jesus, and D.L. Moody would go on to say that was the day that changed everything. When his Sunday school teacher showed up at the shoe shop, because he cared so much to look at the face of this teenager and tell him about Jesus. And he accepted Jesus as his savior and goes on to do incredible things for the kingdom. I read a little bit, just a tiny little bit about him because I'm telling you there's so much. But he was super involved in, in creating and developing young men at the YMCA in Chicago. In fact, he was not, he, he, he did not fight in the Civil War. You know why? Because he was ministering to Union soldiers and, and, and to the Confederate soldiers at the same time. And in 1873, he, he set out to go preach to the nations because of the Chicago fire. It burned down his house and the YMCA and the church that he was preaching in at the time. And so he went out and shared Jesus with the nations. I love that. His name, he has this legacy. You know, there's, there's Moody Church and there's Moody Institute and there's all these different places. And like I said, here I am Googling and he's, his quotes come up all the time. And I'm thinking to myself, it's because of a Sunday school teacher who showed up at a shoe shop that, that I know who D.L. Moody is and thousands and thousands and thousands of believers too, right? Well, this quote, it got me. When we're thinking about the commissioning that, that, that Jesus is sending out his disciples, and you know, spoiler alert, we are disciples of Jesus Christ, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But I saw this quote and I thought, this clarifies things for me and helps me understand it a little more. And it was by the great D.L. Moody. He said this, if we only lead one soul to Jesus Christ, we may, may set a stream in motion that will flow on when we are dead and gone. If you turn one to Christ, that one may turn a hundred and they may turn a thousand. And so the stream, small at first, goes on broadening and deepening and as it rolls toward eternity. I think about the shoe salesman, right? Like the Sunday school teacher that just was like, I'm just gonna go up there today and I'm gonna talk to this kid. How could he possibly have known that he was setting a stream? 
I think about my own life. I hope you think about yours too, because I think we always have to stop and think about the stream that led us to Jesus. There's a reason you are in this room today, right? I don't know what your relationship with Jesus Christ looks like, but I do know this. You are in the room today with your Bible open in community with others who are just trying to be more like Jesus and take him to the world, right? What got you here? What brought you here? Think about it. Who set the stream for you? I started thinking about it for me and um, it wasn't hard to trace back for me. You see, mine starts with a little, um, a little teenage girl in Oklahoma City, and that was my mom, Judy. And when she was 13 years old, her, her family didn't go to church often, and, and she just had a neighbor that would bring her to church, and she just thought it was just wonderful. She loved it, and for some reason, this 13-year-old kid ends up at a tent revival for Billy Graham, and when he says, stand up, she stood up and she walked the aisle. She still has her little booklet and everything. So 13-year-old Judy Wood accepts Jesus. But what was so cool about her story is later when she was in high school, she was so involved with church and she decided she wanted to get involved with this, this organization called Young Life. And she started going to camps. And as a camper, my mom's 84 now, I don't do math. She was you know, 15 years old. She's at Frontier Ranch Camp as a camper. And this is the only picture she has of it because her house burned down when she got a little bit older. And there she is in the upper right-hand corner, a camper at Frontier Ranch, learning about Jesus. And what was cool is later on in her life, um, she marries my dad, and, and they're here in Louisville, Texas, and it was in the 70s, and she said, you know, she had all these kids, there was four of us, and one day she looked at my, my dad and said, hey, you know what, we need young life here in Louisville, Texas. And he's like, I don't know what that is. And she goes, well, let me tell you about it. She probably pulled out that picture. And so then my mom and dad get with a couple other couples and start Young Life in Louisville, Texas. And Young Life is a non-denominational youth outreach ministry that, that takes kids and it, mostly unchurched kids and just tells them who Jesus is by young people feeding into their lives and going where they live and looking them in the face. And, and that's how I met Jesus Christ. You see, my Young Life leader, Don Brown, I took this picture, by the way, would like you to know he was driving at the time. So let's talk about that for a minute. <laughs> Youth leaders, right? <laughs> I took that picture from the back of a van on the way to a, a camp in, in Colorado. And I remember that this guy and his whole crew of leaders would spend time with me and all my little hoodlum friends at Marcus High School He'd show up at games. They'd sit with us in the lunchroom. They'd do things. They'd sit with us face to face and ask us questions and they cared about what we had to say. I was 15, I was a mess. <laughs> and they listened and they would tell us a little bit about this Jesus guy, but mostly they just looked at us and hung out with us and did life with us and showed us who they were. And then as a teenager, I'm at camp with a bunch of other hooligans and I decide, well, I don't know what these people have, but I want it and I accepted Jesus and that was a picture. You can figure out, can you figure out which one's me? How about this? Can you tell? <laughs> I look just the same, right? <laughs> and in the upper right-hand corner, the far upper right-hand corner is this kid that I got to know and ended up being my boyfriend and ended up being my husband and my forever. But what's so cool about this is I started thinking about this stream because I got to know Jesus Christ because there was somebody who invited a 13-year-old Oklahoma City girl to a Billy Graham revival, right? And then a Young Life leader who chose to spend time with kids like me, who then shared the gospel with me, who then I accepted Jesus Christ, and then look at where we are today. Who set the stream for you? Who got you in this room? Who invited you to this place? I don't know how you feel about what we read about the great commissioning, right? We know what that means, but I wanna think of it this way, that we have the opportunity wherever we are to set a stream for someone else. For someday there to be a person like a D.L. Moody that stands up and goes, yeah, it's because that Sunday school teacher showed up at this shoe store, right? Yeah, Chris, Chris Hunter, Chris Murphy learned about who Jesus was. And ultimately later in life, she's teaching people about the Bible because of a 13-year-old kid got invited to Billy Graham. 
I don't know what it looks like for you, but we are here to make disciples. Our church has this whole saying. It was funny last night at Parker Square. I was like, I thought I was so good because I wrote it down because I'm always scared I'm gonna say it wrong. And then literally it's like this massive banner at the back of the screen. Do you know what RPC's mission statement is? You probably do. It may be hanging up somewhere, I'm sure. It's to love God with all that we are. We're making more and better followers of Christ. We're here to make disciples. And so today, we're gonna look at this one little tiny part where Jesus is sending them out, sending us out, and then we're gonna ask ourselves some questions about who we're to set a stream for. Who are the people in our lives that right now God already has them right there? The high school kid at the lunchroom table that needs somebody to look at them and say, you matter and God loves you no matter what. Who are those people in our lives? Listen, um, this little section in Matthew 28, you figured it out already, that's where we're gonna be. Matthew 28, these last few verses, verse 16 through 20 is what we're gonna look at. I think it's important for us to remember something. We are ending with this for a reason, right? This mountaintop is, is the ender for a reason because it's a call to action. It's not just about study and analyzation and what does the Bible say and teach me more and I wanna have a bigger Bible study shelf, right? It's about what am I gonna go do now? Because Jesus is very clear here that we are called to do, not just to be pew sitters, you know? I've, uh, I've heard it say that this, while this is not the most important words he's ever said because all of his words are important, it has been called the focal point of the entire New Testament, this section, because everything leads to this, right? Everything leads to this. Everything Jesus did, everything he died for, everything we hope for is because of this. So I'm gonna go through this section with you and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like for us to set a stream. Is that okay? All right, let's do it. Let's look at chapter 28, verse 16. Let's start there. The Bible says this, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Now you know there's 11 because Judas is gone. We know in verse 27, Matthew chapter 27, verse five, that Matthew tells us that he hanged himself, okay? Terrible, sad, awful, right? But we know now there are, there are 11 of those key disciples and they go to Galilee. That's where this mountain is, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. What do you think about that? Interesting, right? Here we are. Jesus has already um, been crucified. He's resurrected. Now he's in this part where he's showing himself to people, right? And so we know right here, he's showing himself to at least 11. Well, let me give you something else to think about. I read this, I've never heard this in my whole life. I read this recently, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse six, if you go there, that's where Paul is giving a retelling of all the people that the resurrected Jesus showed up to, okay? He kind of gives a list. And in verse six, he says that there's a time that Jesus appears to more than 500. Could there be more people than just the 11 in this one instance? I don't know. One commentary thought that yes, that this could be more than just the 11. And so it makes a little more sense with the quote about that they're worshiping, but they're also some are doubting. Maybe, maybe, just maybe it wasn't just 11. You know, think about at the end of Jesus's life, there was just like a trail of people everywhere he went, right? Remember, he'd have to go across the water to, to teach because there's so many people. Remember, he'd have to go up on a hill because there's so many people. He's feeding thousands of people. So at this point, could it be feasible that there are 500 or so within earshot? Yes. How cool is that? That's us. I love that the doubters are included. Do you love that? I love that because I feel like there's so many different parts of my life where I have believed the lie that doubting is the opposite of faith and I don't believe that's true. I don't. I think it's the one thing that strengthens my faith because you know what it makes me do? Ask questions. You know what it makes me do? It makes me pray, it makes me go to the truth. It makes me investigate and figure out. I, I love this quote by Anne Lamont. She said, the opposite of faith is not doubt, but certainty. Certainty is missing the point entirely. In Hebrews chapter 11, you know this, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things what? Not seen, right? There's going to be times we doubt because he didn't make us robots. You can quote me on that. Put that on a pillow. That's a good quote. 
We are not robots, right? Faith is about making a choice and it's about making that choice over and over and over. It's about making that choice when the worst things in the whole wide world happen in your world and having to go back to this and go, my faith is the assurance of things that I hope for and the conviction of things I haven't seen, right? Well, he goes on in verse 18. And Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Authority. You've seen it over and over. Maybe you don't even realize it. In fact, the entire book of Matthew, the entire gospel stresses Jesus's authority. You know, I told you that there's like the four gospels. And so it's kind of like the same stories, not all the same, but all told from different perspectives. Matthew's gospel is telling us that Jesus has the authority, the one and only son of God. And it's awesome because like Matthew is writing it from a perspective to where like a lot of these people with a Jewish heritage are gonna read this and they knew that they were watching for a Messiah and they knew that there's all these prophecies that have to be fulfilled and Matthew is showing them, he's here, this is it. You remember just last week, Peter, James, and John, remember the authority they got to witness? They got to witness God and his God voice speak from a cloud and say, this is my one and only son. And what were the three words he said? Listen to him, right? God himself gave authority to Jesus right there. We saw that in Matthew chapter eight. He, he's healing. We see Jesus healing all the time, but he had authority to do so. We see the authority that God has given him for forgiving sins. Matthew chapter nine. How about this? How about the authority over Satan himself, over temptation? In Matthew chapter four, there's this whole section where Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted by Satan over and over and over. Do you think that was included just for funsies? I don't think so. I think it's to show us who he is and who we can claim as our one true God in our lives when we're tempted, right? He had authority and he gave authority to the disciples in Matthew chapter 10. He showed them and told them, right? Well, all authority under heaven and earth, that's amazing. And Jesus is saying it from his own resurrected Jesus, Jesus lips. Well, in verse 19, he, he gives them now the command. This is the crux of the passage, right? He starts with this word, go. But my favorite word of this whole passage is therefore. Because the therefore, we always ask ourselves, what? What is it there for? Right. So when he says therefore, he's saying, okay, all these things that have happened in this whole 27 chapters, they didn't have chapters, but you know what I'm saying. Everything that has happened, everything that you've witnessed, everything that I've said, everything that I've done, here we are now, and this is the crux of it all. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Go. Any grammar nerds in here? Okay, here's what's fun. Nobody raised their hand. They're like, no, thank you. Okay, well, I am. So too bad. Listen up. Okay, the word go. The Greek version that's in this text, it's a present participle. You know what that means? It means that it's an ongoing thing. It means going. It means not stopping. It doesn't mean just like go to like the one guy. It means go and go and go and go and go and go, right? That's what it means. That we're called to go. The disciples are called to grow. I mean, go. Grow too, I suppose. They're then told that we're gonna teach all the nations, make disciples no matter where you are. Jill Briscoe, best quote ever, right? Your greatest mission field is what is between your own two feet. Maybe it's 7-Eleven on your way home when you get gas. Maybe it's at Starbucks. Maybe it's Target, the checkout line. I don't know, maybe it's your neighborhood. It's where we are, right? We're not supposed to just talk about Jesus here because we all think the same way and believe the same thing, supposedly, right? We're supposed to take it to all the nations So he says that we're to teach all of the nations, make disciples no matter where you are. Let me give you this. When you think of the word disciples, I know you're probably like, hey, I did not know I was a disciple. That was not something on my business card. Well, add it, because here's what it is. A disciple, important to know what this is. This would not be an uncommon 
relationship, okay? So it wasn't just because of Jesus. See, rabbis at the time, any teachers at the time, they would have disciples that like followed them around, that, that were like trying to learn from them. They were like an apprentice, okay? So like a disciple was somebody that was attached to a teacher. They identified with him, they learned from him, and they lived with him. They saw how he did everything in front of people and when nobody was around, right? And we know Peter, James, and John got to do that, right? Remember, they got to go up with him and pray, watch him pray at Gethsemane, watch him weep and mourn what was coming, you know, all the things. Okay, that was what a disciple is. That is what we are. If we follow Jesus Christ, he's calling us to go and make more followers. You know, I I love, I love our church and the heart of our pastor, who, by the way, let me just tell you a little something about our pastor, Ron Holton. Do you know, do you know that, um, you may know this, that Ron Holton goes and what, he's this guy. His house is one of the first houses built in Lantana, Texas. You know what he's been doing since he's been living there? He goes for walks. And I don't just mean just go for a walk. He goes for walks and he prays over houses and he meets people. And you know what a good buddy of mine told me one time, oh yeah, I know Ron Holton. He invited me to play in a softball team. It wasn't until we were like five games in that I learned he was a preacher. (laughs) That's him. Because what he wants to do is he wants to make more disciples. We're really good at being better disciples. I think Bible study is a great example, right? Like we are here, we wanna learn, we wanna know, we wanna be better but we wanna make more. And that's what Jesus is calling us to right here, to make more. He's also mentioning here that he says that we're to go, we're to share the gospel, be Ron Holton, walk around your neighborhood, right? And also that we're to show the world. The baptism section, that is a symbol for your, an outward symbol for your inward belief, right? And I'll tell you what, I don't know what denomination or faith you grew up in. Maybe you didn't. And, and maybe you've been sprinkled or dunked or whatever you've been. But you know what? If you want to take the step to be baptized in the form we do it here, it's called believer's baptism, where basically you're saying it as an adult person that you've made a decision for Jesus Christ and you want everyone to know it then you come find Lauren Etter. She loves that. Come find me. Let's do it. Let's get you baptized. Let's dunk you right in here, right? Tell the world. He says that we're to go, we're to share the gospel, we're to show the world, we're to teach the word. Hey, I've got news, everyone. We are all teachers and preachers, aren't we? You didn't want to hear that, did you? You didn't want me to go, hey, here's the microphone. Come on up, right? This this isn't everybody's favorite thing to do. Well, you don't have to always have a microphone, (laughs) You live your life, you're teaching and preaching, amen? I think about this. Like years ago when I was younger, um, I, 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 was, I was a believer at the age of 15 and then I just, just kind of did, you know, floated around the way the world just kind of pushed me around for a long time. And then in my 20s, some things happened that kind of pulled me back to him. And I think about those times and some of the first times I ever stepped foot in a Bible study, you know what I felt? Inadequate. I didn't walk, it's nothing, it wasn't their fault, it was me. I felt like before I could tell anybody that I was a follower of Jesus Christ, I needed to memorize things. I needed to know things. I needed to have a fish on my car. I needed all these things, right? I needed to make sure I had a church membership and that I was tithing and all these things. And it's almost like, I just think that that is the enemy's way of discouraging us and reminding us and making us think that we're less than. You don't need all that to tell people about Jesus Christ. Can you just hear me on that right now? There's something beautiful, trust me on this, because this is one of the things that brought me to Jesus. There's something so, so, so cool about sitting across the table and having coffee with somebody who's just searching and doesn't know Jesus, and they look at you and go, I don't know what the book of Ecclesiastes is, and you can go, yeah, me neither, high five. (laughs) Because sometimes you don't, sometimes I think we scare people away because we think that they think that, that we all know where everything is in our Bible and we can memorize everything and we do everything right. And sometimes I think we portray that image and I think there's some beauty in being broken and there's some beauty in being able to look people in the eye and go, you don't have to have all that to have Jesus. In fact, I'll tell you what, Jesus didn't walk around carrying an NIV Bible in his pocket, didn't have it. Either did the new church, right? They had it in here. We are all called to be preachers and teachers. It's the responsibility of every believer. I uh, was going through working on this part and I, I came to this one little, one of the commentaries I was reading and I read this one little passage and it made my heart hurt and so I wanted to share that pain with you, so you're welcome, okay? 
No, I thought it was really good to hear because like I'm sitting here reading, you know, and all my commentaries and I'm trying to figure out what to do and teach and all these things. And it's almost like I got hit in the face with, yeah, that's all good and everything. But if you're not telling people about Jesus, then we got a problem, right? Well, it's a, there's a book called Born to Reproduce by Dawson Trotman. And his comments are on the tendency of the church today. People that all we sit here and we say that we are believers in Jesus Christ. It goes like this. The curse of today is that we are too busy and I'm not talking about being busy earning money to buy food. I'm talking about being busy doing Christian things. We have a spiritual activity with little productivity. The gospel spreads to the known world during the first century without radio, television, printing press, because of the writings of the apostles produced men who were reproducing disciples. But today we have a lot of the of pew sitters. We got people that think that if they're faithful in church attendance and they put good sized gifts in the offering plate and people and get they get people to come, then they've done all that their part is. But if I were a minister of a church and had deacons and elders to pass the plate and choir members to sing, I would say, Thank God for your help. We need you. Praise the Lord for these extra things you do but I would keep pressing home the big job is to make disciples. Winning a man or a woman to Jesus Christ and then helping him or her along the way. That convicted me. How many people have I told about Jesus Christ? How many, how many people have I told about this great, wonderful secret that has changed eternity for me? How many people have I looked in the eye and said, listen, you're cool and I don't wanna be weird, but we're gonna go be weird for a second and I'm gonna tell you some things that you gotta hear. It's risky, right? Sometimes. He's telling us and calling us to that. Well, the very end of this passage goes like this. And behold, Jesus says, I am with you. How often? Always. To the end of the age. It's like he knew we would need to hear that you're never, ever alone. You're never, ever alone. You're never alone, right? He knew we needed to hear that. And you know, he also knew we needed to hear that there's an end game and there's a plan in place and he is the Lord of all history. Not just the past, not just the now, but the future. This part of life, we look at this world sometimes and we're like, this is a mess. Does he even know what's going on? Uh-huh, he does but the world needs him now more than ever, right? Listen, in closing, I, I wanna share a couple quick things with you, and then we're gonna end a little differently than we normally do. I want you to think about something. I want you to ask yourself, are there places in my life that I've become a pew sitter instead of a stream setter? Are we setting the stream for other people I'm asking me too, guys, because trust me, I, 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 am, I love Bible study. I love it. I would just be in it all constantly, all the time. But I think sometimes God's like, yeah, I know you love that. And that's great and that's wonderful. But who are you telling about me? Who are you telling about eternal life through Jesus Christ alone? If you turn one person to Christ, that may turn into a hundred, may turn into a thousand and the stream, small at first, broadens and deepens and rolls toward eternity. I think about my mom and my mom and my dad and my Young Life leaders and how I met Jesus. And you know what's cool for me is a couple years ago, I had the chance to tell the story of how I met Jesus at Young Life camp to a bunch of women. And I, I, it, like, it was a cool moment because I put the picture on the screen and I'm standing up there teaching and someone snapped a shot. And I looked at it later and I thought, isn't that the coolest full circle? I'm not done, let's be clear. He has more things. But like to be able to look at the picture of this broken 15 year old with a bunch of other hooligans on the top of a mountain at Frontier Ranch where my mom was a camper and see that and go, look what God's doing. He wants to do it through every single one of us, y'all. Every one of us. I, uh, one of my favorite stories about D.L. Moody, and this is just like the coolest thing. 
is it, it is rumored to be, to be true that when D.L. Moody walked around, that he had a little notepad with 100 names written on a piece of paper in his pocket. He carried them everywhere he went. They were names of people that he would encounter during the course of his life that he knew he had to pray for. I, I don't know if they were all people that didn't know Jesus. I don't know if there were some people that wandered off, you know, because I think that's the other thing too, is a lot of us like me, 15-year-old Chris, I knew Jesus as my savior, but I sure wasn't living like it. And I kind of wandered off. Maybe those are the people too, I don't know. But the, the story goes that he carried around these 100 names. And when he died at his memorial service, 96 of those names had come to know Jesus as their savior, 96. But four of them at his memorial service received Jesus. All 100 names he carried in his pocket for his whole life. What about one name? What about if we each just, just like thought of one, not 100, what if we just thought of one? I thought about this. I thought, well, how do we start? How do we set the stream? Well, first we pray. Like I said, one name, not a hundred. It could be more than one, but how about one? And then we choose to invest. Like we make the choice. You know, I mentioned the Young Life leaders and the impact they had on me because they would hang out with me. And good gosh, guys, anybody around high school people ever? Who wants to hang out with them, right? Yeah. I look back and I'm like, ooh. My son is a Young Life leader now, and I remember him telling me when he first got trained, he said this. He goes, you know what the hardest thing I ever had to do in my whole life? I'm like, well, your whole life, you're 19. <laughs> but anyway, that's fine. You know what he said? Was to walk into a high school cafeteria and sit down and look at these high school kids and say, hey, I'm Brayden. And he was like, it was the hardest, most defeating thing I've ever done. But you know what he did? He went back the next week. And he went back the next week and he went back the next week. And you know what? I didn't tell Tuesday night this and this is bonus content. You know what he sent me the other day? He sent me a video of getting to baptize one of his young life kids. This kid accepted Jesus and is now a college student and was in Waco, Texas and wanted to get baptized and tell the world. And he asked his goofy young life leader, my kid, to baptize him because he showed up over and over. So who? You're gonna pray for that person. Who are you gonna choose to invest? Who are you gonna show up to? And then how about this? How about we extend some invites? How about we, we, we think about those people that are gonna look at us all sideways and weird maybe when we invite them to do stuff? Because listen, I, like I said before, I don't know why you're here, but I would guess, like when we do the little surveys that we send out later, we always ask people, what brought you to Bible study? They're like, oh, my sister made me come or my friend forced me to be here or my neighbor brought me. Somebody invited you to something at some point and you're here today. Maybe you're the person that needs to set the stream by inviting somebody to something. What's the worst thing that could happen? They tell you, no, you're crazy and weird. Okay, cool. That's kind of true, probably. <laughs> I remember one time I was talking to Greg Methkin. Um, he's our marriage minister here. I was telling him about a hard conversation I was gonna have to have with, with someone. And, and he said to me, you know what? If you start out conversations like this, it always seems to help. And I'm like, okay, all ears. And he said this. His advice was to say, I'm telling you this because I care about you. So how about you invite somebody and say, I'm inviting you because I care about you. And what's the worst thing that can happen, right? They could be a stoic high school cafeteria table full of boys that says, no, thank you. Okay. But maybe, just maybe, they just needed to be seen and known and invited. I don't know. Maybe God's gonna do something that you don't get to be a part of. Even cooler, right? So we pray for people, we choose to invest in them, and we extend an invite. We are doing a thing here today. You saw the cute little tables. That stuff is not for you. You're cute, bless your heart. Not for you, here's what it's for. We wanna do this. The first thing we wanna do is to equip you 
to go and disciple other people, okay? Who, who has been involved in the Flourish ministry in the past at Rock Point, anyone? Okay, cool. We are doing a thing and it's so exciting. What we're doing is we're gonna change up some things about our, our discipleship ministry. We're gonna try to widen the net a little bit. We're gonna try to broaden the scope of equipping all of us to be able to have conversations, to be able to meet with people, to disciple them, to mentor them. Maybe just get a cup of coffee with somebody and look them in the eye and say, I care about you. That's it, right? It doesn't have to be complicated. So what we're trying to do now is we wanna gather names. We want people who are interested in learning more. Um, all you gotta do is scan a QR code and, and type in your email address, that's it. And then we're gonna let you know what we're gonna do later. That's the first thing that I wanted to tell you about. The second thing I wanted to tell you about, which was so amazing and cool, thank you Rock Point Church, is that we decided if we're gonna really be all in with this whole invest, momentum that Rock Point has started, then how about we start with bringing back a coupon code that we had several years ago? A coupon code where if you bring a new friend, somebody who's never been to Rock Point Bible studies before, they are for free, they're free. We're gonna scholarship them, we want them to come. Woo woo is right, there we go. And so what we're doing is we have this code and it's, it's WM some, some other things. WM, anyway, it's probably up on the screen. But what we want you to do is figure out who you wanna invite. Invite somebody and bring them and go, hey, you know what, it's on me. You can even pretend like you paid for it. It's totally fine. I mean, it's a lie, but also, okay, well, whatever. Repent. I don't know. So how about you invite some people to some things? How about you pray for the one person? How about you start setting a stream that way? What we decided to do was we created something um, where we thought, okay, how do we equip ourselves to go out and invite people and bring people and pray for people and just, I don't know, go face to face and get to know some people. And so at the back of the room, there's tables. Each table is the same. You can hit any table you want. And, and, and in a minute, we're gonna pray, and I want you to just pray and think about who that name might be for you. Um, but we're gonna put together these little bags, and we have little gifts and like candy and like a journal, but it also has um, a little, a little um, bingo card that says, come to game night. That's non-threatening. Invite somebody to come play games. Just don't sit at Jessica's table. Might get aggressive. Bring an Uno deck, right? Hey, how about this? Bring a spicy Uno game. Let's do that. But just invite somebody to come hang out with you, spend time, get in your car with you and show up. And so we have a little, a little thing that you can stick in the bag that says, hey, come to game night with me, okay? Because those of you, I love you. You're cute. Where are my game night people? Raise your hand. There's two? Okay, all right, fine. The evening class, they had a lot of game night people. Okay, let me, just, let me just put something right in your face real quick, and I love you, you're precious, you're so pretty. But listen, if you come to game night every week and you haven't brought somebody, now's the time, right? We don't wanna be pew sitters. We don't wanna have a good shelf full of Bible studies or game night victories, Jessica. We want to bring new people, right? Bring them. Show them that church ladies aren't what they think, Amen. And so we have a little section back there of something you can put together for the one. Invite somebody, go tell your neighbor to come. I don't know, but he knows. And you might know right now too who that person is. The other thing you can do, which I love this. Did I, have I told y'all before about my, my um, Bible study that I did like for these little girls? Remember when I told y'all like we sat on the floor and we ate Jello and it was called Glam Girls of God, you're welcome. Best title ever, we need to bring that back. How about you go buy some Bible studies? And remember, if you don't have $5, we don't care. Take them, take them. How about you grab a handful of Bible studies? This is crazy. Are you ready? Holy Spirit just told me. Go get a bunch of people in your neighborhood and knock on their door with a little bag of candy and go, you wanna come to my house and sit around on the floor and do Bible study? Like we could just read this together. It'll be so fun. What if you did that? What if you did that? What if you grabbed some of those? What if you did that? What if maybe there's one person on your street that just wants to be asked, just wants to be seen, maybe just needs to know that God loves them. Maybe you get to be the stream setter for that person. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray and I'm gonna be quiet for a minute, which I know that's the whole thing. It's very hard for me to do, but I wanna give you some time, just you and God, just to talk silently about maybe who that name is, who that person is, you might know. Because I'll tell you, when I started thinking about it, I immediately knew who those names were. 
And then when I close in prayer, what we're gonna do, I think Jessica may come back up and and we're gonna just dismiss y'all and you can hit those tables and make your little bag and take it with you and go invite somebody. Bring them to the summer study for free. Bring them to game night to beat Jessica in all the games. Last thing I wanna mention, you came in and if you didn't get one, you can get one on the way out. There's this little piece of paper. And I just, the only thing about this I wanna say is take some time and look at this. It's an awesome opportunity to sit down and go, okay, what do I believe and how do I embrace the truth of what I believe? How am I connecting with other people? How am I going beyond and serving God's kingdom? How am I seeing this transformation on becoming something? Remember last week we talked about who you become. Just, this was just a, little, just a little extra bonus thing for you because I have a feeling during this gap, he's gonna be doing a lot of work that doesn't involve sitting in a church because he's going to be using all of us to make more and better disciples. All right, will you pray with me, guys? Father, we just, um, we come to you today and like, we wanna be the disciples that Jesus calls us to be, even in the uncomfortable places, Lord. I pray that this is the day that, that each of us just remembers just one, just one name to keep in our pocket just one person to pray over, just one person to invest in, just one person to invite. And Father, I I pray over this room, everyone that's in this room, and then those who are watching online or listening online. Lord, will you just take our stories and show us who set the stream for us? And Lord, how can we keep it going? We wanna keep it going. Show us the ways that you want to use us in the lives of other people, Father. We wanna be disciples. We wanna be disciple makers. And Lord, we thank you so much for every part of this story. But God, if, if all of it was for this moment, Lord, it's worth it. So will you just remind us right now, who is the person that you're putting on our heart? Who's the person that we need to pray, invest, invite, Lord, will you just tell us? Lord, thank you for trusting us. I thank you that we get to be a part of this story, of this plan. Show us the places that you wanna use us, our lives, our words, our actions. And I pray that that eternity is transformed because of what, what happens when we leave this room, Lord. We thank you. Thank you for your son who came to live and he came to die, but he came to eternally resurrect and be in heaven forever interceding for us. And it's in his name that we pray, amen.